Good afternoon, everybody. Um, after such a fulsome introduction, I really am afraid that I'm not going to live up to that billing, but I hope I might have some interesting thoughts to offer at a great stage in your lives. I'm sure you've, you now, I hope, have put the thoughts of all the hard work that was involved in getting where you are today and are now just ready to bask in congratulations and then go forward in your careers with the very manifold duties and responsibilities that you will have. Um, obviously today is a day where we always think about world affairs because it's September the 11th and it's impossible for September the 11th to sound from our lips without us thinking where were we that day, what has happened since. Um, and actually standing here in Berlin, not very many hundreds of yards away from where the Berlin Wall once stood, it also makes me think of it because if you do 9-11 in um, the European system, you come to November the 9th. And that was the day that the wall fell here in Berlin in 1989. Between those two events are a lot of hopes and fears. Um, we are today at another point of great hopes and fears. Um, our continent has seen a new division emerge with Russia, which was unexpected. It is grappling with still with a debt crisis in Greece. And none of us surely have missed the pictures of thousands and thousands of refugees coming into Europe in recent weeks. I just about managed to make it back here <laughs> in order to keep this date, which was very important to me. Um, so I, my speech perhaps was written in some haste, um, but I hope it'll offer you some personal insights. Um, one of which, uh, came up this summer, and basically I, that was when I thought of the title of the speech. Um, when my husband, who is present here, and I invite you to guess who is the Russian pianist and composer in this crowd, um, we celebrated our 30th wedding anniversary, and we celebrated at our dacha in Russia, a small town where we go every summer, and for the first time, my husband had fixed to show the digitally remastered video of our wedding, which took place on July the 30th, 1985, in Wedding Palace Number 1 in Moscow. The statue of Lenin was prominently in the room, and we had to promise to found a socialist family, much to the horror of my mother. Um, so, for the first time since then, we saw this marvelous work. It was shot at the time in eight millimeter film. It was black and white, and it was completely silent. Seeing it again, obviously there was some sadness at seeing our parents and other people on the film who are sadly no longer with us. But the overwhelming impression was exactly what something Helmut just touched on how firmly this was all from another era, a pre-digital age, an unglobalized world, a planet that was divided between two rival Cold War superpowers, one of which operated under a communist ideology and a set of rules that seemed at the time to be an unmovable force. Just four years later in 1989, we learned how fragile the Soviet bloc in fact was. With one bungled misreading of a note, an East German communist leader mistakenly brought down the Berlin Wall. Prior to that, of course, people had been in motion around Central and Eastern Europe. We had had the drama again in Hungary, just as we see a drama today in Hungary. That time, though, it was Hungary letting East Germans through to West Germany, um, cutting barbed wire rather than erecting new fences but a very similar sort of movement to the one that we see today. 
And it was truly ironic that it was East Berlin's rulers who seemed so Teutonic and simultaneously Soviet in their adherence to nonsensical practices who made the mistake that eventually helped topple the entire system. In 1985, however, when we married, we were actually taking a very daring step to get back to this title of She Who Dares Wins. At that time, we had no idea if Sergei, my husband, would be able to leave. If he did, would his parents and his sister ever be allowed west to visit us? Would we be able to visit them back in Moscow? And this summer in Russia, showing this film of our wedding to people who did not know us then, but are the same age, knew the Soviet system, many of them marveled at all we had undertaken, how we had worked to thwart the KGB in its attempts to separate us, and so on. Having lived through this same era, these friends could imagine what all that that entailed. Yet our children and their children our 22-year-old daughter, our 31-year-old nephew in Moscow, can only gawp and perhaps imagine, though I can't really think that they can imagine how absurd Soviet communism frequently was. But maybe they can just stop, as you should, once in a while to remember that the history of this part of, this, of the world is very scarred still by the idea that there were many borders you could not cross there was an awful lot of daring that you could not attempt, and winning was definitely not something that could be claimed as an individual achievement very often. Sometimes, Sergei and I don't really know why did we go ahead with all of this, but I think the answer lies in youth, in energy, and the fact that love is perhaps blind. In daring, we won. After a hiccup that took some diplomatic tact and some luck to solve, he was allowed to leave. Then in 1987, Perestroika and Glasnost entered the world vocabulary. For us, the effects were personal. Trips in and out of the Soviet Union for work and pleasure became routine. Our Iron Curtain pretty much fell two years before that momentous night, which I was lucky to witness, which brought down the wall here in Berlin. Perhaps, in fact, we're of a generation that was simply lucky in its timing. Those of us born in the 1950s had parents who were happy to have survived World War II. Against its chaos, they built up an order that many young people found cloying in East and West. Culturally, that rebellion against this cloying order was expressed in rock music. That, too, crossed the artificial divide of East and West, daring to use unconventional melodies, instruments, lyrics, and yes, mind-bending drugs, to deliver a very different message. It caught on. This is another discussion, a side one, but it really is sometimes worth thinking, would there have been the Berlin Wall falling as it did without Western rock music? If you think about all the occasions in which that stirred the imagination on both sides of the wall. At any event, we were a generation that had the luxury of daring, in a way. The world was growing wealthier, tra travel became cheaper and much more attainable, cultures started to blend. Multinational marriages like ours became more common. Daring to go beyond the familiar became the trend, rather than bucking it. And then came the collapse of communism, then came 9-11, then came digitalization and globalization. These forces seemed beyond, sometimes, the imagination and control of individuals. A very different kind of daring is required to buck them, although we do see exactly these attempts being made these days. I don't know how many of you have seen Karen Goering Eckhart's video already that she has put out on, against hate propaganda that is being spread digitally, but it's one of those things where I think we all need to dare to think how we can triumph over this. A very different kind of daring is now required. What we must avoid, though, it seems to me, is the kind of collective daring that hopes to exercise any kind of tyranny. 9-11 is indeed an example of that. Um, we've grappled for a response 
that both preserves the individual liberties for which we say we stand, and which I am sure you will all go out and propagate in your very different fields of work. Um, and yet we, can, we would need to afford our society sufficient protection from those who are ready to die in pursuit of their quest. They have a quest against a large range of enemies, it seems, secularism, the West, materialism, to name just a few. We do not applaud this kind of daring, because I would call it more daredeviling, and we certainly do not want it to win. Collective daring as a force throughout history is usually harnessed to serve a state or a ruler or a religion. I don't think that's changed very much, but our advances in thinking have. The title of this lecture is much more concerned with the individual. I think individual daring is by definition not as powerful as physical force as collective daring. But in order to triumph, it requires not just physical stamina, but expression, one of the things that we journalists try, strive for in our famed first draft of history. And you should have seen me last Friday night at about five o'clock in the morning, so Saturday morning actually, as the first refugees arrived in buses from Hungary at um, the Austrian-Hungarian border. I was walking up and down with my phone dictating to New York because there was just the last edition of the newspaper was about to close. This is very old fashioned print journalism. Obviously I was also concerned to get the news out on the web. But there was a part of me that also wanted to be on the front page with my byline um, in print. And I was say I was confused with what was going on and it, I held up my phone to one editor and I said, you can hear what it feels like here. And it was, you know, hundreds of people had arrived. There was an amazing hubbub. And I said, well, I'm basically crossing between a place called Hegye Shalom, H-E-G-Y-E, to Nikolsdorf, and um, I'm not quite sure what's happening, but Jake, it's the first rough draft of history, okay? So you have to make it smooth and make it work. Um, it was one of those moments where you sort of feel very privileged to be a journalist because it's up to you to express something in terms that are sufficiently universal and yet feel it personally enough to give it some kind of energy, which I hope I succeeded in doing. That's the end of the commercial for me, but um, it, brought, it really did bring home the degree to which you need individual strength to express things. And if you want to dare and you want to win, you have to make, a, make it very clear to yourself what it is that you are out to do and be flexible enough to switch and sure enough yet in the rightness of, of your cause, your own personal cause, um, to get it done. I think that the individual who dares wins only when her or his idea is realized. And you can always adjust your goals, but you should never lose sight of them. Another personal note, it was very important to me to call this lecture, She Who Dares Wins. Because we all know that equality of all kinds is much more accepted today in many, though certainly not all, places in the world. But it does not happen automatically, and I really can speak from experience here. When I was the editor of the International Herald Tribune, we started a series called Female Factor. And lots of people contributed, and there were many, many very good men editors and reporters who were involved in it. But I really do think that had the executive editor not been a woman, that series would not have happened. And I, it's the kind of thing that you have to bear in mind when dealing with all kinds of people who deserve or are claiming equality. As, and it's a very new and transforming adventure, I would say at least as much as digital technology. Because it is a new idea that men and women gays and lesbians, Africans, Asians, everyone, people who are physically impaired but mentally super alert, the idea that they have an equal shot at daring and winning 
is something that is very, very new to us human beings in terms of sort of women's liberation, if you want to call it that. It's probably traceable in the West really back a century or so, but actually making this big push, much less. And if we look at Hillary, Hillary Clinton, for instance, uh, running a game for the presidency in the United States, I think we have to ask ourselves whether part of the reason that her candidacy still isn't quite taking off is, do people, are people really ready to elect a woman president? Um, it's a very different process than choosing a leader here. And also, I don't think that many Germans 20 years ago would have predicted that at this moment they would have a chancellor who was a woman who'd been in power for almost 10 years. So it's really only if we keep pushing an equality of opportunity will the force unleashed by that choice have a chance of helping form our world. And I really do think that that's an important thought to take with you into it. You have, in fact, all grown up in what I must now call a very new and different era. I'm sure I seem like some kind of Methuselah to you to even mention communism or black and white film or something that is silent. And I really have to recognize that when I was starkly, we were starkly confronted with this very different era, it was sort of a shock to realize, my God, you know, that was a long time ago. And it was only 30 years, which isn't really that long, but it definitely was enough to make a big difference and to, to feel as obsolete as the very title Wedding Palace Number no. One now seems. So I'd like to send you on your way with a message that I'm sure, you know, you're much savvier, you're much more experienced, have traveled the world more than I or most of my contemporaries had at your age, probably. But one thing that has guided the refugees, for instance, as we've seen in recent weeks, I don't know how many of you have paid attention to this, but this is a smartphone migration. It is being guided by people who get directions either from smugglers or have figured it out themselves. And, you know, anybody, will, anybody in Seged in Hungary or Subotica in Serbia or Budapest or Vienna will hold up for you a smartphone with Google Maps marked up in Arabic as to where they should go to push on into Germany. And I think we will see and hope that they display as much courage and, uh, and enterprise in making their way in the societies that they arrive in. But no amount of technical guide can ever be the real, the sole guide in such a decision. Similarly, no amount of respect for rules and practices will teach you exactly when to dare to break one. And winners really do come in many forms, by paths that were not clear from the start and may not be clear to us now. Think, if you like, of Barack Obama or Angela Merkel. Who knows, maybe one of the many thousands of refugees who have tramped their way into Germany in recent weeks will grow up to be the first Muslim chancellor. That person or his or her parents have already dared a lot, as has this society, in deciding to welcome them in. Now let's see whether you, they, and all of us can win. Thank you very much. <laughs>